Gacchami Dutiyampi Buddham Saranam Gacchami Dutiyampi Dhammam Saranam Gacchami Dutiyampi Sangham Saranam Gacchami Katiyampi Buddham Saranam Gacchami Welcome, friends, to this Wednesday evening Dhamma discussion and meditation practice. And uh, I hope you're able to continue your meditation practice the last couple of weeks uh, while we these uh, programs were suspended. Uh, <clears throat> so this evening we're going to be uh, starting the review of the Samaditi Sutta which is number nine in the Majjhima Nikaya. And the samaditi is the means the right view, or the discourse on the right view. And uh, <clears throat> this discourse is a very important discourse because right view, of course, is the first step of the Noble Eightfold Path. And without right view, really, uh, the rest of the Noble Eightfold Path cannot be properly uh, practiced. Anyway, this uh, sutta is actually given by the Venerable Sariputta, who was one of the, the chief disciples of the Buddha and often called the captain of the Dhamma because he, he, he was able to explain the Dhamma you know, better than uh, a lot of the other uh, monks, uh, you know, so, you know, second to the Buddha in in explaining uh, the Dhamma in a clear way. <clears throat> now, so the <clears throat> we've covered this sutta before, but uh, we're going to go over it again. I hope you were able to read at least uh, part of it. But uh, I'm going to read the first uh, part of it uh, again, and then uh, be discussing some aspects of it. So, when Bosaid Putta was, you know, addressing a, a large group of the monks, and he said, uh, yeah, he asked the, the, the monks, he said, one of right view, one of right view, it is said. So that was a saying, you know, one of right view. Then he asked him, in what way is a noble disciple one of right view? Whose view is straight, who has perfect confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Now, this uh, statement is, is important because it points out when one really has the right view, uh, they would be a sotapanna. So the meaning of this, uh, one whose view is straight, who has perfect confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma, is a kind of a definition of attainment of sotapanna, of entering the stream. And uh, that is why it is said that a sotapanna is you know, standing on the real right view. And that means the super mundane right view. Now there's two types of right view, mundane right view and super, main, uh, super mundane right view. Now, these different uh, divisions uh, 
or meanings of right view that we're going to be going over that Venomal Sariputta had explained. Uh, you know, again, they have the, the two levels. The uh, mundane right view means uh, anybody who has not reached the level of a uh, Sotapanna has the mundane right view because they lack that penetrative uh, direct experience of, of no self uh, or the, the crystallization of the Four Noble Truths in the mind that it uh, is such a powerful experience that it, it destroys the first three fetters. Uh, and one of them is doubt. One of the first three fetters is doubt and doubt about uh, the illusion of the self. And so that's uh, what he uh, what is the meaning of one who has perfect confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. That perfect confidence means one who has gone beyond doubts uh, about the Dhamma, and that is only somebody who has at least attained the stage of the Sotapanna, because they clearly see uh, anicca, dukkha, and anatta. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Uh, and so the other monks say, indeed, friend, we would come from far away to learn from the Venerable Sariputta the meaning of this statement. It would be good if the Venerable Sariputta would explain the meaning of this statement. And having heard it from him, the bhikkhus will remember it. And so now, uh, now that they're attentive, because that's the main thing. And when you listen to Dhamma, you have to be attentive. That's why, you know, there should be no cell phones on, no beepers on. Uh, people should be fully alert and attentive because it's only when they're attentive that they will be able to understand uh, the meaning of the Dhamma because Dhamma is uh, very deep and it's not ordinary uh, chit chat. And so you have to be very uh, alert and uh, focused and uh, <clears throat> that's what these uh, monks, you know, they, they, we'd come from afar away. Now people just put on their internet and they listen to Dhamma talks on the internet. But in those days, they had to walk 20, 30, 40, 50 miles just to hear Dhamma talk. They had that much, uh, you know, <laughs> energy. Uh, they were that committed to the Dhamma. Now people won't even drive five minutes, uh, you know, or 10 minutes or an hour. Uh, you know, they just want to flip on the internet and listen to a Dhamma talk. So it's, and then in their house, so they get distracted because their cat comes up and jumps on their lap or, uh, or any number of uh, other dis distractions. So that's why people have, you know, they hear these Dhamma talks over and over and they still get perplexed and have questions. And that's simply because they're not focused. Anyway, I just wanted to set that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, attitude. So, so this first uh, division uh, definition of the the right view is when friends a noble disciple understands the unwholesome and the root of the unwholesome, the wholesome and the root of the wholesome. In that way, he is one of right view, he or she, or they or them, whatever you want to say now, please. Uh, whose view is straight, who has perfect confidence in the Dhamma, and who has arrived at this true Dhamma. Again, that meaning uh, a Sotapanna, but uh, for those uh, that have not attained the state of Sotapanna, at least uh, you can, you know, try to have right view, or you have the mundane right view, but uh, the real right view is the super mundane uh, right view. So then he says, what is the unwholesome and what is the root of the unwholesome? Uh, now, I'm not gonna repeat all these things, but basically he says, it's the five precepts. If you're breaking the five precepts, you all know what the five precepts are. Uh, 
those uh, five unwholesome actions, that is the unwholesome, that is the, the unwholesome. And what causes us to break the five precepts? <clears throat> He's saying that uh, the root of the unwholesome is greed is the root of unwholesome, hate is the root of unwholesome, and delusion is the root of the unwholesome. So the root cause of breaking the precepts, and of course, it's unwholesome is not just limited to those five precepts, but those are the, the big ones, you know, but other precepts and other, you know, kind of you know, thoughts and speech are, are also can be included. So anyway, greed, hatred, and delusion, we all know that greed, hatred, and delusion are the three roots of uh, the sansara, of accumulating negative karma. Uh, so that is the understanding. When you, you truly understand that greed, hatred, and delusion is the root of all unwholesome thought, speech, and actions, uh, then you have understood uh, the, you know, the unwholesome and the root of the unwholesome. Now, a lot of people say, well, what do you mean? You know, hatred, you know, it's not so bad, you know, this and that. No, uh, that's because you haven't fully understood it. Or greed, you know, we can have a little greed. Okay, uh, that's <laughs> mundane, uh, mundane understanding. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's why a person, if they say these kind of things and they haven't arrived at the, you know, having the perfect confidence in the Dhamma or haven't uh, reached that level of the real right understanding. Anyway, so then he goes on to say the, the wholesome, then what is the root of the wholesome? The wholesome and the root of the, un the wholesome. So it's the opposite. It's it's uh, living by the five precepts, abstaining from breaking the, uh, the pancha sila, okay? So basically it's the opposite of the unwholesome. And, and the, uh, the root of the whole, the root of the wholesome is, uh, the non-greed, the non-hate, and the non-delusion. So it's, you know, it's exactly the opposite of the unwholesome. So when a disciple has thus understood the unwholesome, the root of the unwholesome, when he has understood the wholesome and the root of the wholesome, that person entirely abandons the underlying tendency to lust. They abolish the underlying tendency to aversion or anger and hatred. And they extirpate or uproot the underlying tendency to the view and conceit I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, they here and now make an end of suffering. In that way too, a noble disciple is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has perfect confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true uh, Dhamma. Now that, that statement where it says, he, he abolishes or extirpates, uproots the underlying tendency to the view and conceit I am. That is the, the deepest form of delusion. So that's it called uh, delusion. The, the deepest uh, level of delusion is the conceit that I am. And it entirely uproots that. And so that means, that means the state of an arahant. Only the arahant is totally, completely uprooted and eliminated, uh, you know, greed, hatred, and delusion. So, uh, 
you know, this, these uh, statements. The, the first statement is one who has arrived at the right view has perfect confidence in the Dhamma. That refers to the Sotapanna. One who has completely extirpated, uprooted the conceit uh, of I am, the I am delusion, along with the root of greed and hatred, then that pertains to uh, the Aram. So, you know, if, if one could, you know, just truly understand those, you know, the root of the unwholesome and, the, and I mean, the greed, hatred and delusion and how that causes every conceivable type of negative karmic action that you can think of would fall under one of those categories of greed, hatred and delusion. But delusion is underlying even greed and hatred. So delusion is actually the deepest one. Uh, greed and hatred are easier to overcome than delusion. Uh, normal. Uh, so if, if one could just do that, then conceivably one could attain uh, you know, liberation. But in understanding the root of the wholesome and unwholesome, uh, you know, it takes all the rest of the practice of the Dhamma. That's why it, uh, normally one cannot just uh, immediately uh, understand that right off. So anyway, so the, the monks, uh, uh, Rejoice, they said, sadhu, 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 when Venerable Sari put the, uh, you know, finished that first section uh, about the Arhant having arrived at, at the, you know, the true Dhamma. Uh, but then they, they went on to ask him another question. But friend Sari put the, might there be another way? in which a noble disciple is one of right view, has arrived at this true Dhamma. Venerable Sai Putas, you know, said, ah, there might be a friend. And this is when he goes on to the second section. He said, when friends, a noble disciple understands nutriment, the origin of nutriment, the cessation of nutriment, and the way leading to the cessation of nutriment, in that way, they are one of right view, has arrived at this uh, true Dhamma. So again, that means when they really understand it, they become a Sotapanna. Uh, and so they transition from mundane uh, right view to the super mundane right view. Uh, and then what are these nutriments? What is the what is the nutriment? What is the origin of nutriment? How do nutriments cease? And the way leading to the cessation of the nutriments. So the, the nutriments basically I'm not going to read all this you you, you know I want to encourage you to read the sutta yourself because you, you retain it more in your mind when you, when you read it and uh, read it several times rather than just uh, hearing at once. So basically they're material food. So we have to eat material food to keep this body alive, to keep the cells of the body alive, uh, to keep regenerating, you know, and uh, creating new cells and, uh, you know, the life for the body. And then the second one is contact. That means the contact with the senses. We have all the senses, uh, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and uh, even the mind contact, but especially the five senses. Uh, that also is food for uh, the mind. So there's a nutriment. One is a material nutriment for the body. And the other three nutriments he mentions 
are nutriments for our mind. That means contact. Because without contact, we'll just remain basically unconscious. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, we, we crave that. We crave contact with the world. So you can see that it's nutriment. That means it's food, just as we eat food, right? We eat material food. So we, we eat sound, sight, smells, taste, touches. That means we have that craving for them. So you look at some beautiful object and the, you know, the, the eyes are eating that up. You smell something, you hear something. We're craving, we want to eat more and more. <laughs> We can see our, you know, we're always wanting to hear new things, see new things, smell new things. Uh, and that's the, that creates this contact that uh, keeps our mind uh, busy. So that's why the contact is considered uh, a food. Because, you know, you've read about stories of babies uh, who don't get contact much. Let's say a baby is born and they put it in a box somewhere. You hear these stories, or leave it out. They don't get contact with the mother, you know, the touch uh, and uh, other things. If it didn't hear anything or see anything, basically the brain wouldn't develop and it would just, you know, it, it wouldn't develop. It would just stay in a very uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of baby-like state, I guess. So it needs those contacts. Uh, and that's what, how we learn about the world. And then feeling. Uh, or let's say, no, uh, mental volition is the third. Physical food, contact. Uh, the volition, yeah, the volition, that means we, uh, you know, the thoughts and the, and, the, and the craving and so on, the volition to go after those sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touches, those contacts, they stimulate our reactions. Uh, and so, and that's what uh, creates karma. The, the volition is basically the karmic reactions that we take. And that's what builds our, our brain cells and our connections uh, to the world is the memory and, and the repetition of uh, the, those volitions. And that's, that's food. That's the way our brain uh, develops. And so that's why it's considered food. If we don't react to anything, the brain is not going to develop and it's memory and so on, and it's a craving and desires uh, for the world. So that's why the mental volition is the third, food, because again, it's food, it feeds the brain, causes our brain to develop. Uh, and also the body, volition means exercise. If you don't get any exercise, your muscles won't develop, and you won't be able to walk you know, baby has to learn how to walk, right? They crawl around, that's volition. Because they see something, they want to crawl after it. You know, they, you know, babies are crawling all over. So they're exercising, they're eating, their eyes are eating these objects. They're causing the body to, the volition to crawl toward the object. So this is all food for the nervous system. Uh, and then the third is the consciousness. Uh, and basically it becomes the, the ego consciousness with the sense of, I want these things. Uh, but it's, you know, just the consciousness itself is the awareness of all these things that we're, uh, you know, come in contact with, it's the consciousness. And then that, you know, causes the, the desires and so on to grow. And so we crave that consciousness. Uh, that consciousness is the food for the for the ego. Uh, anyway, so those are the what are called the the four nutriments. So when one has understood that, and just intellectually, you might hear this and say, ah, "Okay," you know. but uh, only when you meditate in deep meditation, you get insights and you realize, "My gosh, that's that's the truth," you know. Uh, 
uh, and that's why you know you can have this mundane right view of the 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 nutriments, but only when you you know you've reached that level of understanding the dissolution of the ego and how it's the ego that really is the source of the craving and the desire and the wanting these foods, the wanting to eat sounds, the, the wanting to you know eat food and to eat all the sensory objects and the, and the wants to go and, and get them, you know, to to get them or get away from them. It's the ego that's doing all that. So <clears throat> That's why it's important. You can only see that when you have realize that in deep meditation. When you really see the, the mechanisms and all the, the games and scheming, scheming and conniving and, and you know, the ego to, to get what it wants or to get away from it wants. You just really see, wow, you know. But you only can see that in deep meditation. Uh, anyway, that's why... <laughs> one who has really seen and understood the nutriments, the cause of the nutriments. And uh, you know, only, and then what is the way leading to the cessation of nutriment? So we see the nutriments and we see the cause of the nutriments is, uh, you know, having the body and your senses are open and then it's the you know the the reactions to them but what is the way leading to the cessation of nutriment and it is just this noble eightfold path that is right view right intention and the rest i'm not going to repeat them because you all know them and we're going to go over them uh, later so uh <clears throat> those uh those four nutriments uh, is an important aspect of the of the right understanding. And uh, so the monks, uh, you know, again they said sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. You know, they delighted in what Venerable Sariputta was explaining. And then they said, "Yes, that's all well and good, but uh, Venerable uh, Sir, you know, might there be uh, another way?" in which a noble disciple is one of right view, has arrived at the true Dhamma, and so I put a, oh, there might be friends. And so this is when he goes on to, uh, to talk about the four noble truths. And this is when, this is when Sariputta then gives the, the normal definition of right view that you read about in some other suttas. It says, when friends and noble disciple understand suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the way leading to the cessation of suffering, in that way, the person is of right view. Has a, and has arrived at this true Dhamma. And again, that is the meaning of uh, reaching the, the uh, Sotapati, a person who becomes a Sotapana, has penet what's called penetrated the Four Noble Truths. And that's why it's called super mundane right view, because you penetrate it. Not just thought about them and say, yeah, that's cool. I believe that, okay. But that's not penetrating them because the penetration has to come from mindfulness, concentration, and uh, the wisdom, especially the mindfulness and con concentration is really the, one of the, the main way that one can penetrate that veil of illusion. Uh, so, so basically, it's it's understanding uh, the four noble truths, and then he goes on to you know uh, give the the normal explanation of well, you know what is suffering, what is the origin of suffering, what is the cessation of suffering, what is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. You know, it's, 
So again, you can read it there, birth is suffering, you know, not getting what you want is suffering. Uh, in short, the five aggregates affected by clinging are suffering. This is called suffering. And what is the, uh, uh, you know, the origin of suffering is craving. The cessation of suffering is the fading away of craving. And then again, the, the path leading to the cessation of suffering is, is just this noble eightfold path again. So uh, in all the rest of these categories, uh, that, that same, uh, he's going to go through the whole Paticca Samuppada, but we're going to stop uh, for now and I'm going to uh, you know, answer some questions. Uh, and we will uh, finish the other parts or carry on with that uh, in next week. But because uh, <clears throat> there's a lot here just in these first three uh, uh, paragraphs of this sutta, uh, categories, definitions of the right uh, view. But that one, the third one we just read, understanding suffering, the cause of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the path leading to the cessation of suffering. This is normally the standard sort of short uh, definition of right view. Okay, now having gone over that uh, much, uh, let's see if there's a what if there's any question in the chat box? Um, well, if you, uh, Karuna, if you happen to, uh, you know, talk to John and Lynn uh, Kelly again, please uh, uh, convey my uh, kind regards to them uh, as well. And thank them for will, their, uh, thoughts. I will, Bonte. My colleague classes every week with him. Okay, that's very good. Uh, okay. So that was all there was in the uh, chat box. Now, somebody had sent me uh, two questions on this sutta uh, in an email. So I'm going to read them. Uh, this one question is, does right view include awareness of one's direct experience to the world as immediately sensed so as not to be misled by the names and labels? Well, yes, it includes that, but that would probably be uh, well, it's because that's covered under the, uh, the fourth noble truth, the path leading to the cessation of suffering in the development of right effort and right mindfulness and right concentration. So, uh, you know, the, the right view in, in includes, you know, the steps of right mindfulness and right concentration in the eightfold. Uh, path. So in that development of mindfulness and concentration, if you develop it uh, to a certain uh, high level, then you will then have the direct experience of the, of the world and uh, gain that wisdom. Uh, but that usually would refer to a person who has attained sotapanna. So a sotapanna ha would, would have that. Anybody who hasn't attained sotapanna, they may or may not have that depth to directly experience beyond thought and uh, so on. Uh, but you know, one can get a, a, a pretty good mundane right view about how uh, you know, the, the mind creates its names and labels and, and so on. But uh, the right view does include that because the right view uh, also includes the super mundane right view. So uh, right away, <laughs> for a beginner, it's probably not going to uh, 
develop into that direct, uh, that very high or deep state of, uh, you know, detachment and mindfulness or vipassana type of, of mindfulness. It takes that kind of higher level of vipassana level uh, or first jhana level concentration with vipassana, vipassana jhana to clearly see uh, that level of, you know, how the mind creates its illusions through clinging to names and labels and, and so on. Are the higher stages of meditation practice as much concerned with disentanglement from good karma as from the bad karma? Uh, well, the higher stages of meditation practice, now, of course, you know, you have to know what, what are the higher stages of meditation practice. So when you when you reach that level where you reach the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, or fourth jhana, okay, then uh, you know it's it's disentangling from uh, certainly the bad karma, but even the good karma. It's not your mind is not going after you know it's you know not uh, actively uh, trying to do, you know, go out and do good karma, you know, it's not going out and practicing dana and, and sila, these things have already become automatic. Uh, so they're, and they're creating good karma in the sense of being able to stay in the jhana for longer periods of time, of course, is uh, certainly good, a good mental karma. So it's, it's, only disentangling from the good come when it uh, reaches the state of the, uh, you know, the, the path and the fruits, and especially the, you know, the state of the, the anagami or the, the arahant is totally disentangled uh, from the good come because as, until you're an arahant, you're still practicing the eightfold path, and all those steps of the eightfold path would be considered good come. Uh, so even the concentration and the mindfulness, attaining uh, jhana, developing insights, uh, is all good come. <laughs> so you're still practicing that in, until one uh, reaches actually the state of, a, of an arahant. Then only then you could you say one goes beyond, you know, even the subtle refined states of practice. You're no longer practicing anything when you attain uh, the Arhat stage. Uh, so, but uh, the lower states of meditation practices are concerned with doing good. First, you have to overcome all the wrong things. So you have to deliberately practice right view. You have to create the effort to accumulate right view. You have to, to do, make the effort to accumulate right thought. You have to accumulate the effort to, to practice right action, right livelihood, right speech, uh, and right meditation. So in all of those, you are, you know, you are actively uh, concerned with cultivating the good karma uh, as a way of overcoming uh, the bad karma. But once you overcome the bad karma and you attain those levels of, of those enlightenment, then you, you no longer have to practice Dhamma because practicing Dhamma is to overcome suffering. Once you've overcome suffering, there's nothing more to practice, uh, you know, from the, the, the Theravada standpoint. Okay. Does anybody have any uh, questions on uh, any of those things we just uh, were talking about? If you want to raise your yellow hand or uh, there and ask a question, you could. Bonte, there are questions in the chat box. There's like three of them. Uh, well, I already looked at two of them. Is there another one? Oh, three new messages. Okay, let me check them out. Is misconduct and sensual pleasures 
is unwholesome, the same as sexual misconduct. Yes. Now in the precept, when you read sensual misconduct, that actually refers to abusing any of your senses, but the sexual misconduct where you're really doing harm, probably you create the hardest and uh, strongest negative uh, karma from uh, you know, the sexual misconduct, or abusing and harming people through that. But are people addicted to TV or couch potato, for example, uh, that would be misconduct in sensual pleasures, just watching TV eight or 10 hours a day, enjoying all these weird things, stuffing yourself with food all the time, you know, uh, uh, you know eat, overeating, eating junk food, uh, you know, developing any kind of addictions uh, is a sensual misconduct. So sensual misconduct is a, bribe, a broader term than just sexual misconduct. But the sexual one is this, usually the strongest, very uh, strongest type of desire that people have, right? Uh, but the other ones can equally be uh, addicting. We all know that, you know, uh, people get addicted to music, uh, wanted to hear our music and, and uh, you know, all these other sensual things. So it's abusing them, basically abusing any of the senses that it interferes with your life and it causes you to accumulate, you know, uh, you know, hurting your family or hurting others. Uh, because look, at when people get, get addicted to drugs, it ruins their whole family sometimes, right? It's not just one person. You're not just doing that to yourself. When you harm yourself, you're harming your relatives and your friends and your family that then has to help you deal with these problems or be directly affected by your addictions, you see? So that's how we spread that suffering out. My understanding is sensual pleasure referred to all five senses. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess I just I just talked about that. Okay, this question. Uh, when you said I am is delusion, could you give an example of what that means? Well, you're regarding yourself as being some kind of a permanent being. And that's when you, when you get the experience of no self and you see how the, the sense of ego has just been created from just after the time you were born, as I've already explained many times in different talks, you'll see that it's a, it's a delusion in the mind. It's, delusion means taking something to be real that in truth is not absolutely kind of real. It's something that's been created. Like a magician produces delusions in people. They pull a rabbit out of the hat and they think it came out of nowhere. They don't know he had it up his sleeve, right? Or something other trick. So you delude people. People deluded like they're, you know, they say, oh, God spoke to me and uh, they think they're a prophet or they, they think they've reached higher levels than they have. That is a delusion. Uh, so that, that's the meaning of the I am delusion. That's the deepest form of the delusion. Might it be wise to review each of the eightfold elements frequently to assess if one is consistent following each element. I don't know, what do you mean by elements, eightfold elements? You mean- Steps, the I mean steps. Okay, the step. yeah, absolutely. You should read it every single day, you know? <laughs> every day, remind yourself, right understanding, right thought, right, right speech, right? And, and, and check, uh, how are you doing that every day? You know, is your understanding right or wrong when you're about to do anything? Or your thoughts, your intentions to do anything? 
So yes, absolutely. That's why you have to keep uh, studying the Dhamma over and over and over and repeating it hundreds and thousands of times. You know, put the five precepts up above your door before you go out of the house in the morning. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. To remind yourself. Okay, friends, I think we've gone on uh, long enough. And uh, I don't, is there another question in here? Is that right? The four consciousness? Oh, what's happened here? The, the consciousness and the four nutriments. Is it the six sense consciousness? Yes, it is. Consciousness manifests through the six senses. So it's, it's pretty much the same, the same thing. Okay, so friends, let's take a few minutes break and then come back and then we'll do a few uh, stretches and then uh, sit down to have our meditation, okay? See you back in a few minutes. We just need every single every single.
Or stand straight, relax your shoulders, arms at the side. Close your eyes. Feel your feet pressing the floor. Feel your eyes and eye socket. And feel the outline, standing body. And begin some deep, slow breathing, drawing the air from the lower lung up through the middle to the upper chest. Hold the air in the lungs for two or three seconds. And slowly breathe out. Developing this mindfulness, breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, standing here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, standing here and now. We're going to combine this breathing with these movements, repeating each one three times. On the next in breath, raise the arms over the head, interlock the fingers, turn the palms up, straighten the arms, stretch your head back, look at the back of your hands. Stretch upwards, out breath, touch the top of the head. In breath, touch the arms up, head back, stretch up, bend backwards a bit. Out breath, touch the head. Third time, hold that upward stretch longer. And bend back a little more. Feel the arch in the lower spine. Release the fingers. Out breath, arms back to the sides. Close the eyes. And feel the outline of the body. Feel the increased pulsation in the fingers. Feel the clothing touching the skin of your arms and chest. Just mentally remember standing. 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 Gradually centering the awareness of body, letting go of your thoughts, and the next in breath, lift up on the toes while raising the arms over the head, facing the hands toward each other about six inches apart, stretch up. Out breath, come back down, arms to the sides. Use the in breath to help lift up the body. More. Close the eyes. 
with the outline of the body, the increased sensations, pulsations. Head balanced on top, the arms at the sides, feet pressing the floor, clothing touching the skin, any or all of those places, connection to the present moment. out of your thoughts, out of your head into the body. Remember standing, standing. Next, we'll do the side bending using both arms. For the in breath, raise both arms up. Keep your fingers and arms straight, close to your head. On the out breath, bend over the right side. Keep your arms parallel to each other like railroad track. In breath, lift up. Pause a moment. Then the other side, out breath. Once more to each side. Out breath, lower both arms, close the eyes, and let the mind wander through the body, connection to the present moment. You lose that connection to the body, the mind gets lost in a stop. the outline of the body. If you want to think, just think standing, standing, standing. Now spread your legs and feet apart about three feet. Moving the arms out at the sides, we'll be twisting from right to left. And breathe in. The out breath, twist to the right. Keep your eyes focused on the hand going back. In breath back to the front. Let your feet turn with the body. The other side out. Continue 
in your alternative side. Go front, lower the arms, close the eyes. Feel each foot pressing the floor. Clothing touching the skin of your legs, arm and chest, and the head balanced on your top. Body exactly as it is here and now. Those different sensations, heartbeat, pulsation, prickly sensation, aches and pain. All those contact. You know, place your hands together at the chest. The in breath, the hands over the head. The out breath, hands to the chest. Bend both knees, lower down. Feel the stretch from your knees and hips. In breath, up the muscles in the legs. Turn the body up. The out breath. So, move the eyes, move the sensation of the exercise will generate different sensations, combinations of sensation. Notice that keeps your attention centered in the body.
Next one, you forward and backward bending. Legs spread apart. Wider the better. Your hands touch the front of your thighs. Breathe in. Out breath, bend forward, let your hands come to your kneecaps. First time, keep your head lifted up, looking out straight ahead. Try to flatten your spine, keep the hump out of the spine. Feel the stretch in the back of your legs. In breath, lift up. Bring the hands under the buttocks for support. Let your head go back. In the out breath, gently bend backwards. Keep your eyes open. In breath, carefully lift up. The word and shake it. And get out breath, bend forward. Let the hands come below the knees. You'll keep the head up. Legs straight, feel the extra stretch in the hamstring muscles. In breath, lift up. And back bend. Be careful. Right. And the third time, let your hands come down as far as you can toward your ankles and feet. Then hold on. A little bit longer through the stretch in the legs. Let the little bones in the lower spine stretch out. And in breath, carefully lift back up. And once more, the back bend, be careful. In breath. In the out breath, relax the shoulders and arms. Let your eyes rest the attention on the eyes to the outline. The body exactly as it is. Head on top, arms at the sides, feet spread apart, touching the floor, clothing touching the skin. Yeah, the prominent sensation. This body exactly as it is here and now. Contacts, sensation. Feel the vibration of the present moment awareness from underneath all those sensations. Check the knowing awareness. You know, 
your legs and feet back. Push it together. Just one last exercise with head turning from right to left. In breath, head to the right. Look over your right shoulder. Turn your eyes further to the right to see something further behind you. In breath, all the way back to the left. Look over the left shoulder. In breath, let the head stop in the center. Through the outline of the body. With an activated life force. Vibration of the present moment awareness. Here and now, aware, natural awareness. Okay, now let's mindfully come back to our sitting position, ready for the meditation. Sit for your meditation. Your friends are going to sit straight. Uh, 
line your spine and the back of the head in a straight line. Gently close your eyes. Feel the eyes in the socket. And feel the vague outline of the sitting body. Feel the head balanced on top. The arms and hands at the side. Legs bent, feet tucked underneath. Feel that solid contact. Body sitting on the cushion, the buttocks. Just remind yourself of the present moment of sitting, sitting. Just try to hold that outline of the sitting body in the mind's eye. and begin some deep, slow breathing like we did in the yoga session. It'll take two or three seconds to draw the air from the lower lung up to the middle, to the top of the lungs and chest. And that expansion in the upper chest, hold the air in for two or three seconds, allow all the oxygen to Get into the bloodstream, slowly breathe out. Feel the last bit of air go out of the lungs. A brief pause for the next in breath. Let's continue taking Several more deep, slow breaths like that, developing this mindfulness of breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, feeling the whole body. Now we're going to count our breaths from one to ten, develop a more continuous concentration on the breathing. I'll do the counting for you, just try to follow that with your breathing and concentration. With the next expanding in breath, mentally count to one. Hold the air in for one or two seconds. With the contracting out breath, also count to one. Feel the last bit of air go out of the lung. The next in breath, two. Out breath, 
to in three Out three, in four, out four. In five, out five. In six. Out six in seven. Out seven in it. Out. It in nine out. Nine in ten out ten. Now discontinue the counting, let your breathing return to its uncontrolled, shorter, irregular rhythm. You continue to feel it. Keep your attention focused there in the middle of the body. You feel the residual expanding and contracting movement. The abdomen, rib cage, your chest, as it naturally goes in and out. Just knowing when the breath is coming in and knowing when the breath is going out. Knowing is the alert awareness. Just 
especially try to notice the sensations of your clothing rubbing against the skin on your abdomen, stomach, rib cage, your chest. It expands and contracts. So many different little sensations that are changing. Feel the brief pauses between the breath. They help you stay focused. You can use these mental reminders. In, in, sitting. Out, out, sitting. In, in, sitting. Out, out, sitting. Breath by breath, moment by moment, cultivating mindfulness and concentration. Letting go of your thought. Let the thoughts come and go in the back of the mind. Just keep the sensations of breathing body in the front of the awareness, like looking in a mirror. In, in sitting. Out, out, sitting, that ongoing, ongoing connection to the present moment, the mindfulness of the body. Be like a scientist looking down through a microscope, observing an experiment, this experiment of breathing. Notice how each breath is different, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. Sometimes you feel it more in the abdomen, sometimes you feel it more in the rib cage, your chest. It's always changing. You'll be able to notice three or four more sensations that one expanding in breath, contracting out breath. It's 
turn up the power of the mental microscope. Bring it into clear focus. In, in sitting, out, out, sitting, notice those brief pauses between the breaths. Sometimes they're longer or shorter. Feel the outline of the sitting body in those pauses. Feel the vibration of present moment awareness. Is the mind lost in thoughts, recognize it as lost, lost, 
thinking, thinking, take a deep, slow breath, bring the mind back into the body, back to the here and now. In, in, sitting. Out, out, sitting. If you want to think or contemplate something, contemplate the, the wholesome and the roots of the wholesome, unwholesome, the roots of the unwholesome. Just think about how greed, hatred, and delusion causes all the various types of negative, unwholesome thoughts and actions. Now the opposites of non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion bring less problems.
in, in sitting out out sitting so many sensations come and go feelings come and go perceptions thoughts ideas come and go thoughts of i me or mine come and go This is all just a continuous flow and flux of impermanence of the five aggregates, the body, mind, and this world, constant change, without any owner or controller going on through the power of the past and present accumulated karma. The three characteristics of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and no self. This is the right view. That is overcoming delusion, being established in non-delusion.
thoughts and feelings arise based on that food contact sound. Dukkha Pata Chani Dukkha Bhaya Pata Chani Bhaya Sokha Pata Chani Sokha on to some people, may the suffering be free from suffering, may the fear struck be free from fear, may the grieving be free from grief. In this way, may all beings live with mindfulness and wisdom. Thus spoke the Buddha. I invite you to join, close the meditation with chanting word sadhu three times slowly. We do the chanting on a long out breath. Try to feel those vibrations in your body and mind. Take a deep breath. Sa Mindfully place your hands at the edge of your knees. Take one more deep breath. As you breathe in, stretch the head back, pull your hands on the knees to arch your spine backwards. Lift the head up on an in breath. On the out breath, press the chin to the top of the chest to stretch the neck vertebrae. Lift the chin up level on an in-breath. Relax on an out-breath. Put a smile on your face. Okay, friends, so this brings our evening uh, the meditation to a close. And during the next week, just try to, you know, try to take those first two categories of the Samaditi Sutta, 
observe the wholesome that comes up in you or the world around you, or the, the four nutriments you can contemplate and the four foundations of the mindfulness the Buddha have us contemplate these truths internally in ourself and externally we can see these same roots of greed, hatred, and delusion in other people. They get into arguments and fights and do negative action. See their craving to have contacts, volition, and their ego consciousness. You contemplate the Dhamma anywhere. All right? Okay. So be well, be safe, be Mindful, be wise, Namo Buddhaya. We'll see you again. Namo Buddhaya Bhante. Namo Buddhaya Bhante. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Namo Buddhaya Bhante. Thank you. Great. That was a great uh, speech right there. Namo Buddhaya, everyone. Thank you, Bhante. You're welcome. Okay. Namo Buddhaya. Thank you, Bunty.